very good morning to all of you i hope all of you are uh, still fresh and uh, receptive uh, today's lecture is uh, uh, yet another important lecture for the context of this particular training genomic assisted molecular systematics of fungi uh, this lecture is all about real time pcr technique i believe all of you have some knowledge about pcr if you do not have knowledge about pcr then it becomes difficult for you to understand the qpcr uh, please tell me if any one of you never had experience with pcr let us be very honest thank you i think all of you are at least experienced pcr one or other time in your research career am i right be a little more interactive yes or no yes, yes that's good so um, the purpose of this lecture is let you know about the historical background about this qpcr or real time pcr and where we can use this technique in plant pathology in general and mycology in particular so the purpose is very straightforward here the substantial part of this lecture is dealing with the qpcr and maybe a couple of slides i will tell where we can use this qpcr or real time pcr technique in plant pathology i am dr a kumar principal scientist in this division and if you have any questions please write down and let us have this discussion in the end of the presentation and if you have too many questions please send a mail it's already written there this lecture is yeah there was small technical issue uh, in this lecture i will give a brief introduction about this qpcr and the terminologies and acronyms used if you read the literature about real time pcr you frequently come across real time pcr quantitative pcr quantitative real time pcr right that is also confusing with another rt pcr that deals with reverse transcriptase pcr so the question is which one is the correct terminology there is no consensus so far but what i believe a simple acronym qpcr would make it unique and that is quite different from a conventional pcr so for all practical purpose let us use qpcr the q is always written in small letter but i am seeing some papers even in capital letter it is written q pcr with separated by an hyphen so most often i have seen q small letter and pcr in capital letter so that only indicates that somebody has performed real time pcr in their experiment and history of pcr and q pcr let us take couple of slides on that what prompted the scientist to invent something like q pcr and a little bit of historical account on that and the major differences between pcr and qpcr so uh, all of you must know uh, what are all the fundamental differences if if any and of course uh, when you talk about qpcr the results are visualized and the technology associated with the visualization of this qpcr is so important for us so right now we have two different techniques one is the dye based quantitative real time pcr and another one is probe based 
quantitative real-time PCR. I would say dye-based qPCR and probe-based qPCR. Let us have a very detailed discussions on that. You are supposed to know how this technology works because the core of qPCR is centering on these two technology which monitors the polymerase in reaction which is going on in the tiny tubes. And of course, we'll be talking about the data analysis. Let us not go too much into the technical issues of that because you are going to have a practicals on that. In practicals, we'll deal with that uh, data analysis, the data which is generated from qPCR experiments and how to analyze them. So we'll be giving you a kind of demo in the practical room. And of course, we have two different analysis is possible in qPCR. One is absolute quantitation and another one is relative quantitation. Both are very important and both has got its own significance and the context varies. Let us discuss on that one also. And of course, the applications. So this is a nutshell about the whole lecture I structured into. Uh, let us take one by one. Quantitative polymerase in reaction is a method by which the amount of PCR product can be determined in real time. In nutshell, you can monitor the reaction endpoint in qPCR, right? And you must know the difference between PCR and qPCR. In PCR, you set up the reaction in a machine and you really don't know whether something is happening or not. But in qPCR, right from the word go, you can monitor whether the reaction is happening or not. So that is a major advantage of this particular technique. Often it is abbreviated to qPCR, which I already emphasized here. This method is sometimes also referred to as real-time PCR or RT-PCR. qPCR does not rely on any downstream analysis in particular, the tools which is used to visualize the results, for example, electrophoresis. We don't do this very often. Or densitometry to visualize the result or quantitate the results. And it's extremely versatile, enabling multiple PCR targets to be assembled, assessed simultaneously. So this is one of the another biggest advantage of this qPCR. What I mean to say here is you can amplify multiple targets in a single reaction. What is called as multiplexing is possible in qPCR. It's very useful for investigations on gene expression as well as estimating the number of copies of the target. And these two incidentally relevant for the subject like plant pathology. And the key feature in RT-PCR or qPCR is the amplification of DNA is detected in real time as PCR is in progress with the help of a kind of camera, what we call it as a fluorescent reporter, right? So the monitoring the reaction in the tube is possible with the help of some chemicals we add in the PCR mixture. We'll just move ahead. This is a, a little bit of history about PCR, and all of you must be knowing. Remember, this is a history of PCR, and not exactly qPCR. Uh, all of you must be knowing. Uh, the, the first report of a replication of single standard DNA from a template uh, that was demonstrated in science in 1970, and the uh, ingredients which we normally we use in PCR nowadays, the development that took place after 1970. I think that is just coinciding with emergence of this subject, the molecular biology. And stepwise, uh, things started coming together. And the tipping point in the whole in vitro replication of this DNA happened in 1983. In 1983, uh, it was demonstrated that the DNA can be replicated in vitro, right? Just by changing the temperature, by adding specific ingredients in 
the PCR mix. I think I'm sure all of you must be knowing about these developments. Nucleic acid amplification and detec detection techniques are among the most valuable tools in biological research today. I must really highlight here, after PCR, the biological research has made a quantum leaps and bounds in science. And there is a kind of a clear, cut, clear cut distinction, a pre-PCR era in biology and post-PCR era in biology. And if you see, if you make a comparisons, the kind of developments that took place in molecular biology, which ultimately culminated in a subject like genomics, it was dramatic after the invention of this particular tool, that is PCR, right? Scientists in all areas of life sciences, be it as agriculture, be it as biotechnology, medicine, environmental sciences, and forensic diagnostics, you just name any branch of science which deals with this biology, you cannot think of an experiment without PCR, right? It is so integrated in our biological research. PCRs are a kind of routine in most of the experiments. I'm sure your PhD or MSc thesis, at some point of your experiments, you felt there is a need for PCR, right? So you cannot do away this PCR technique from your thesis projects, right? That really signifies why this PCR and, of course, the latest updated version, that is qPCR, are so important in science. If you talk about the classical PCR, normally you wait for a couple of hours and maybe another couple of hours to know whether the technique worked or not, right? At the time of setting up the PCR, maybe you set up in 25 microliter or 50 microliter. After two or three hours of uh, subjecting the cocktail into different temperature regime, again, it looks same. There is no difference. So visually, you are not convinced that there is something happened in the last few hours. So you have to wait for another couple of more hours to know whether the target, whether the target in the form of amplicon whether it is really appearing in the, in, the, in the matrix, the visualization tool, what you are using, that is electrophoresis, whether it is there or not, you will come to know. Uh, that means you have to wait for uh, five to six hours to know whether the PCR worked or not, right? That is one thing. The second thing is, of course, you got some amplicons. Can you tell how much of amplicon is there in terms of copies or in terms of of course, you can elude that amplicon and you can go for some kind of quantitation. But you cannot tell how many copies of the target is there in that particular amplicon. I hope you understand what I'm emphasizing here. It's impossible in the case of conventional PCR. So there are many applications we need to quantitate how much of the targets are there in the PCR product. That is possible only in the case of qPCR experiments. So what I mean to say for many applications, quantitative nucleic acid detection is sufficient, qualitative is sufficient, but there are several other applications that demands there is a need for quantitative analysis. And this quantitative analysis is possible with the help of qPCR. Real-time PCR can be used for both qualitative and quantitative. Having said that, real-time PCR is an additional uh, over the Q, normal PCR. That means the qualitative analysis is possible in the case of normal PCR. But in qPCR, the added advantage is you can have this quantitative analysis also. And choosing the best method for your application requires a broad knowledge of this particular technique. This is also very, very important. So you need to know how this qPCR technique works before you lay your hand on this particular tool. Anyone? Who is this famous person? Anybody, please, louder, please. Carrie Mullis, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost him a month ago, right? Uh, this is a paper, what appeared in a kind of uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor symposia on uh, quantitative biology. Uh, uh, this paper is all about is 
thought process and uh, all about the techniques which never felt at that time is going to change the face of biology once for all, right? This is a paper about uh, specific enzymatic amplification of DNA in vitro, the polymerase chain reaction, right? And this was presented sometime in 1983. And Carrie Banks Mullis, born in 28, 1944, and very recently passed away in August 7, 19, 2019. He was an American biochemist. In recognition of his invention of the polymerase chain reaction technique, he was awarded Nobel Prize 10 years after his seminal publication on this PCR. That was in 1993. And of course, he shared it with another famous scientist, it's Michael Smith. It's all good. In 10 years' time, from 83 to 93, a great deal of uh, discussion on this new technique in biology that was going, doing rounds. Silently, another group of scientists, they come out with a kind of proposal to make it even more popular. So, while Mullis invented PCR, a group of scientists uh, under a kind of uh, uh, a company that is Roche Molecular Systems Incorporate, they upgraded it to qPCR, right? That has happened incidentally exactly in 1993, right? So the paper appeared again in a very top end journal that is Nature Biotechnology. The title as a kinetic PCR analysis, real-time monitoring of DNA amplification reactions. Hikochi, he was working for Roche at that time, and uh, they come out with a publication that is all about uh, monitoring the PCR reaction by making small changes in PCR cocktail. And of course, they added a kind of camera in the PCR machines, the two major uh, interventions. One is they slightly altered the, the PCR cocktail, some additives they brought into uh, the, the mix so that the DNAs are decorated. And the decorated DNAs are image captured using another tool, and that tool was attached with the PCR machine. So these two major inventions brought out a new technology in biology, that is qPCR. Just read it, in 1993, Hikuchi et al. recognized that the process of PCR could be monitored by adding a fluorescent label that binds to accumulating PCR product. As the concentration of PCR product increases, the intensity of fluorescent signal also increases. They used the very famous dye we use in agrostial electrophoresis, that is ethidium bromide, for the detection. So that was the starting point for this qPCR. So now, this discovery that paved way for the modern day quantitative real-time PCR. The only uh, innovation we brought here is we stopped using this ethidium bromide, we replaced it with the dye which is much safer in biological laboratories. If you read original papers, they used ethidium bromide to decorate the DNA so that the decorated DNA emits some kind of color and that color is captured by a camera. And the only difference is considering the, the toxic nature of this particular ethidium bromide, people felt it is not wiser to use this ethidium bromide. They replaced it with a uh, yeah, safe and also a stronger dye. We'll talk about that in the coming slides. Of course, in 1996, again, a lot of variants started appearing in the literature. In addition to the dye-based quantitation, people started using much better and much sensitive and uh, uh, extremely reproducible uh, probe kind of uh, thing to detect or to monitor the PCR, what is called as Tachman detection methods. Right? Uh, that is, in, it came as a replacement for ethidium bromide for real time detection of PCR. 1996 is again a landmark year. Uh, first time 
a company came out with a prototype or the, 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 the machine in which you can perform qPCRs. So that was uh, what is called as sequence detection system. They called it a sequence detection system. And that instrument is ABI 7706. It's a very, very famous qPCR machine, right? So in, this is in a nutshell about the, the persons who uh, played a key role in bringing a new technology in biology, that is qPCR, and also few landmark decisions people made so that the qPCR can be monitored uh, in a reproducible manner in many laboratories. This is a machine, ABI 7700. That is all about a little bit of introduction and also the historical background about qPCR. Let us take a kind of uh, 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 small discussion on the differences between the normal PCR and qPCR. Uh, hereafter, I would call this normal PCR as a conventional PCR and the qPCR. And I already made a point here, in conventional PCR, you are bothered about what is amplified, right? And in the case of real-time PCR, you are bothered about how much is amplified. Now, that's a big difference, right? So in addition to what is amplified, and also you are going to address how much is amplified. So this is a, a fundamental difference between this conventional PCR and real-time PCR. And a specialized technique allow you to monitor the PC reaction in, uh, in a real time. And if you talk about uh, the quantitative polymerase chain reaction, uh, this is a method of uh, PCR that allows to follow in real time the amplification of the target, hence the name qPCR. And in real time PCR or qPCR, it's a technique in which you are going to use some fluorophores, probes. Please pay attention on that. Fluoroprobes bind to specific target region of the amplicon to produce fluorescence during PCR. It's nothing but the color is captured by the machine. Right? The color is captured by the machine. The color is produced when the target, what is the target here? Suppose if you are, you are amplifying a specific gene, I think most of you must be using uh, ITS, that's internally transcribed space region for your fungal identification. So ITS region is the target, right? So here what we are going to do is the target is, uh, what do you call, uh, is bound with a dye, or the dye, that is called fluorophore probes, right? And once they bound, the complex, the double-stranded DNA and the dye, it emits a light. And that light is captured, right? So the fluorescence, I, I would call it as, a, instead of light, I would call it as a fluorescence. The fluorescence is captured. I would say it is not only captured and also measured in real time, that is detected in PCR cycler with an inbuilt filter fluorometer. So basically, you made a change in normal PCR machine in such a way, there is something which is attached to the PCR machine which can see the fluorescence, which is coming from the target, which is in turn bound with the fluorescent dyes. I hope you understand this, right? So the complex between the target, that is invariably a double standard DNA, once it is bound with the dye, it emits a fluorescence. And that fluorescence is captured by a special attachment in a PCR machine, right? This is something like this. This is a kind of uh, a PCR machine, which is combined with a special attachment that is called as spectrofluorometer. 
a PCR machine which is attached with spectrofluorometer is called as qPCR machines. There's nothing more than that, right? So, if you want to monitor something, you need to install something there, right? If I want to monitor you in a street, I put CCTVs, right? So, the CCTV, analogically, it is here, the spectrofluorometer here. Right? We, we, we install this spectrofluorometer in PCR machine to see what's going on in a small tube. And what this spectrofluorometer sees there? It is seeing the fluorescence which is coming from the double standard DNA. Right? And this is spectrofluorometer which is kept on the top and you have the PCR machine which is in the bottom. Right? Something is sitting on the top and monitoring what's going on inside the tube. That exactly happens in qPCR machines, right? And this is a little bit, you know, always you, uh, you must remember, uh, in, in, it's, it's a typically a kind of uh, spectrophotometer kind of stuff here. You have a, a kind of uh, uh, excitation, emission, all those things you keep in your mind to understand this, right? Uh, the, the, the chemical we added in the PCR machine, uh, it emits, it gets excited, uh, under a specific wavelength and it emits a light which is another wavelength, right? So, and the emission is captured by the spectrofluorometer. And this is emit specific wavelength excited by specific wavelength. One of the greatest advantage of this PCR machine is the excitation is provoked by normal light, something kind of blue kind of light, it's not a UV light. So that brings some kind of uh, safety kind of thing into the whole uh, story, right? Yeah, this is a typical conventional PCR. Right? Can you tell what all in the conventional PCR? Jagmogan, can you tell what all in the conventional PCR? Yeah. What about template? Okay, yeah. So, by and large, we have around six to seven key ingredients in PCR, right? So, the whole reaction happens in a buffer, and you have uh, something like uh, a primus, which is going to prime the reaction, and you have uh, the substrate that is in the form of uh, uh, DNTPs. I think you, you understand what is DNTP, right? MSc students? How many DNTPs are there? Any MSc student, please answer this question. How many DNTPs are there? Four. I'm glad you know that. So this DNTPs, you have some kind of enzyme that is a polymerase enzyme. And to, to what do you call mediate that enzyme, we add some special chemicals like magnesium, right? And we need, we have a template and a specific region of the template is going to be amplified. In a conventional PCR, you have all these things, right? In the case of qPCR, real-time real PCR or qPCR mix, you have everything. There is no difference. Plus one. The plus one is what is called as, popularly called as, detector. Right? This detector can be a dye, it can be a kind of probe. I'll try to make you understand what is the difference between these two. Right? These two are completely different chemistries. Right? So the detector is the one which makes the difference between the conventional PCR and the real-time PCR. Rest all same, there is ex exactly same. So the detector. This detector can be a kind of dye. I already told ethidium bromide, they started with. I replaced it with another dye, right? And a specific detection that is what is called as detective probe. Right? The detector can be either a fluorescent dye or it can be detective probes. Yeah. Try to understand this. Right? It can be a fluorescent dye or it can be a detective probes. Next few slides we'll talk about this only. What exactly is the difference between this fluorescent dye based monitoring of PCR and how it is different from the detective probe based monitoring of real time PCR, right? Yeah, this is a dye based quantitative real time PCR. 
and this is a probe-based quantitative real-time PCR. In dye-based quantitative real-time PCR, I already put the point there, they are non-specific. Right? This dye can go and bind to any double-stranded DNA in its path. I make it very clear. Right? I hope you understand this particular point. It's very, very important. Right? If you ask me which one is so important in PCRs, can you figure out relatively which among the six or seven ingredients is so crucial in PCR? All are important, no doubt. If you miss any one, the PCR will not happen. I'm just asking relatively if you grade it. Enzyme? Of course, this enzyme is so important, no doubt. But I would rate the primus is very important. Suppose if you want to amplify a specific target, the primus are so important. All are equally important, no doubt. But primus are directly impacting your progress. So you need to have the right primus. The primer should amplify only the target. It should not miss prime with something else in the genome and try to produce a fake amplicons. Right? If it happens, your fluorescent dye based will not differentiate whether the target is amplified or the non-target is amplified. That's what this particular point is made here. They are non-specific detection. Right? But in the case of uh, detective probe-based detection, it is so specific. You can appreciate maybe after listening the slide. Right, so the, the take-home message from this particular slide is we have two different parallel uh, uh, detection methods in qPCR. One is dye-based, another one is probe-based. We'll just move ahead. Let us take the first one, that's dye-based quantitative real-time PCR. Right? So all of you must be knowing there are certain chemicals. They go and bind to the double-stranded DNA. Ethidium bromide is the classical one. All of you must be knowing, right? And we use an alternative fluorescent dye in our real-time PCR that is what is called as cyber green. Cyber green is a kind of generic name, and there is a, it's a big. Chemically, it's a quite big one. Try to understand that. This cyber green, much like ethidium bromide, it, it intercalates in the double standard DNA. Okay? Intercalation means it go and bind to the grooves in the DNA. I think you just recall the DNA. There's a major groove, minor grooves, right? It's a twisted one, right? It goes and binds to the groove very specifically, right? Uh, it, it, this particular chemical is selectively binds in the minor groove of double standard DNA, right? So this property is exploited in qPCR, right? It is more convenient to have on hand a less expensive than probes. Remember, the, the dye-based ones are relatively cheaper. Maybe once you listen to this uh, probe-based one, then you will understand why it is cheaper. Of course, the disadvantage, which I already told, it does not recognize what is getting amplified. Whether target or non-target, it's going to bound with, it's going to bind with the minor group. So there may be a possibility of the so-called false positives, right? And the dye-based quantitative real-time PCR, non-specific detection, and cyber green is one of the most important, very popular. And remember, it's not alone. There are so many other variants. We have Cyber Green 1, 2, Eva Green, LC Green, Pebo, Yopro, Cyto family, and the list is expanding, expanding. Right? This is the alternative dyes one can use in real-time PCR. Right? So this is how it looks. It's going to uh, intercalate in the minor groove of double standard DNA. All right. Any any clarifications on that? Jot down, and we'll discuss in the end. Let's see what exactly is happening here. What is your template? You just 
imagine your PCR mix. What is PCR mix after all? You have a water, you have buffer, right? You have magnesium chloride, DNTPs, primers, right? You have enzyme and template, correct? So what is the status of the template here? The template is double standard, all right? Agreed or not? It is a double standard DNA, it's a template here. And in terms of quantity, how much of quantity you are using in as a template? Maybe 25 nanograms or 50 nanograms. That is extremely a small quantity, right? So this question students always ask. When I make a cocktail of this real-time PCR chemicals, I have the template already there, right? And I have the cyber green also added there. So there may be a possibility that the cyber green is already getting intercalated in the double standard DNA. That's the reality, yes, it does happen, right? So that intercalation of the basal quantum of double standard DNA the quantum of the fluorescence is too feeble for the machine to capture it. Try to understand this point, it's so important. And this is related to the quantitation which we'll be talking after sometimes, right? And it is, the chemical is freely floating there, right? And also there is a double standard DNA, maybe 25 to 50 nanogram quantity, all right? Now what happens, the, what is the first step in PCR? Forget about QPCR, come to PCR now. What is the first step in PCR? Denaturation. The double standard DNA is converted into single standard DNA, correct? Isn't it? So then again, what happens? Annealing. After annealing, what happens? Extension. After extension, what happens? What happens? double standard DNA is formed again, right? So imagine the first cycle, one become two, right? What happens? You have too many cyber green molecule and two lesser DNA. You got my point? You have too many cyber green, two less a DNA. In the first cycle, what happens? Any idea? What would be the status of this cyber green? The, the free cyber green will go and bind to the newly formed double standard DNAs. Is it clear to all of you? Right? So the free cyber green is getting depleted. Second cycle, two become four. Now what happens? The freely floating cyber green is going to bind with the newly formed double standard DNA. So it is getting depleted again. So every passing cycle, the new double standard DNA is formed that is going to be intercalated with the cyber green molecule, which is freely available because in PCR mix, we added cyber green at a specific concentration and it is standardized. Is it clear? So every passing cycle, the freely available cyber green is getting depleted. And where it is getting depleted? It is getting intercalated in the newly formed daughter DNA strands. Right? So what is, what is happening here? You can see here, this is freely floating here. See here, this enzyme. So this is becoming two strands and the cyber green molecules are now attached here. In solution, the unbound dye exhibit very little fluorescence. Remember, another interesting property of this dye is when it is floating, the fluorescence is extremely low. And it gains strength and it gives fluorescence after intercalating with DNA. That is a unique trait of this particular cyber green. Is it clear? So that means the intercalated dye in double standard DNA is going to give you far better fluorescence 
than the unbound dye, which is freely floating along with other cocktails in PCR. Right? So every passing cycle, the double stranded DNA is going to capture this cyber green into the minor grooves. Right? So every newly formed amplicon is going to be embedded with cyber green. Try to understand this. Cyber green one binds to the minor groove of the DNA double helix. After annealing of the primer, dye molecule can be bound to a double stranded DNA. DNA binding results in the dramatic increase in cyber green one molecule to emit light upon excitation. So after fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, when you reach around 20th cycle, the substantial quantum of your amplicon is already intercalated with the fluorescent dye. That means the can give you a kind of fluorescence that can be captured by the spectrofluorometer which is kept on the top of the machine, right? So let us see in a pictorially how it happens. Uh, that there is a progressive increase in the fluorescence as the amplicon accumulates. And that's what I explained now. There is a progressive increase in the fluorescence with passage of every cycle, yeah, passing every cycle, right? Now, there will be a stage, the fluorescence is so much and the machine is able to see it, right? So, this is what is called as progressive accumulation of fluorescent signal from the double standard DNA. And it is directly proportional to the amplicon accumulation in PCR mixture, okay? So, intensity of fluorescence is measured by spectrofluorometer. Remember, every cycle is monitored by spectrofluorometer. The only thing is it is unable to get the signal because signal is too feeble. As polymerase adds more and more of amplicon and that is uh, directly taking the cyber green from the yeah. mixture. So at some point of time, you get the machine started uh, capturing the signal from the double stranded DNA that is in turn presented to you in the form of a graph, right? Let's see what's really happening here. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of advantages of this dye based before we uh, move on. Very easy to produce because all you need is a typical PCR mixture. You have to add only a cyber green or any of the variants which I already uh, told. It's very cheap. Easy to handle, uh, sensitive, effective, and of course, the disadvantage which I already highlighted, it is non-specific, right? And this is a camera which is kept on. This is a PCR machine which is in the bottom. Any doubts on this dye-based qPCR? Anybody? So remember, the dye is intercalated in amplicon, right? That is double standard. And the progressive accumulation of amplicon indicates that there is a progressive accumulation of fluorescence. And this fluorescence is captured by the so-called spectrofluorometer. In nutshell, your qPCR is nothing but a normal PCR where we added something to decorate the DNA and the decorated DNA is monitored by a camera Right? That is called as spectrofluorometer. Okay? Accumulated dye is monitored. Yeah? Try to understand that. Let's move on to uh, the next one. Uh, bit tricky. Yeah, try to understand. Don't get confused. Probe-based quantitative real-time PCR. Right? Probe-based qPCR relies on a sequence-specific detection of desired PCR product. Okay. Remember, you have primers. The primers are specific for those genes or the genomic region, whatever it is. In probe-based quantitative real-time PCR, you have, I won't call it as a primer, I would call it as a probe. That probe is nothing but a kind of short, it's like nothing but a primer only, there is no difference, except for the fact that this primer is designed from a closer by region of the original primer what you designed already. You got it? 
in, in, in other terms, put it in a very simple language, you are putting two primers there. We don't call it as both of them are primers. One is the typical primer because it primes a polymerase reaction. Another one is similar to primer only, but it is called as a probe. What it does? It will go and bind to the target. Right? I'll take one example. If you want to amplify a gene called, let us say, flea C in a bacteria, or ITS in fungi, or TEF in fungi. So you design two primers. Right? And one you call it as a primer only, another one you will call it as a probe. Why? This particular nucleotide sequence you are going to add some chemicals there. Right? One chemical is called reporter and another chemical is called quencher. Right? In, in, in other terms, you have a short nucleotide sequence which is very specific for the target. Right? And you have a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. Is it clear? In both the end, you are going to add, in 5 prime end, you are going to add the reporter, also called as fluoropro or fluorescing chemical. The other end, you are going to put the quencher. Right? Unlike cyber green based qPCR method that detect all double stranded DNA, Pro-based qPCR utilizes fluorescent labeled target specific probe. Fluorescently labeled target specific probe. What I told just now, you are going to add the fluorescent molecule in the short nucleotide sequence. Hence, the name is fluorescent labeled. Right? So, only thing is, we don't allow this fluorescence to happen just by adding another chemical, what is called as quencher. Right? So, that, that this is a property of this probe. You should understand that. A short nucleated sequence, a, a fluorescing molecule is there and also quencher is there. They are so close to each other, maybe separated by 18 to 24 nucleotides. Right? Since they are so close to each other, the quencher will not allow the fluorescent molecule to fluoresce. In other terms, it keeps the fluorescent molecule shut. Right? This is clear to all of you. This is what is called as fluorescently labeled specific nucleotide sequence, also called as probes. Okay? So, the advantage is they are so specific. It will go only to the target from where you design the probe. Okay? Let's see, uh, remember some classical examples of this kind of probes or Tachman probe, very popular. And you have molecular beacons, you have scorpion primers, you have hybridization probes. These are all some of the variants, much like cyber green and so many other variants we talked about. Here too we have a different variants, right? So Tachman probe, molecular beacons, scorpion primers and hybridization probes. Just move on. Let us take one example that is a Tachman probes. So, what's happening here? R stands for the fluorescing chemical, Q stands for quencher, right? So, you set up a PCR mixture, right? Here, what is extra here? In dye-based one, what was extra? Cyber green. Here, we don't add cyber green, instead we add this probe. <coughs> Excuse me. So this probe is added along with your normal PCR mixture. So what happens in the first step? Double standard template is converted into two single standard. So what happens? You facilitate so called binding, complementary binding. What happens? The probe will go and bind. Correct? Is it clear? So, let us not forget, you have primer also in the mixture. So, what happens now? Primer also will go and bind. Correct? Probe will go and bind in one region in the gene. The primer will go and bind in 
upstream of that. that that's a small trick. We'll come to that later. So both now, you have a DNA template, you have a probe found here, you have primer bound here. Now what happens? The most important enzyme in operation now. What is that? Polymerase, right? So now, double standard is converted into single standard, and you have the probe already bound. You have the primers. When intact, the fluorescence of the reporter is quenched due to its close proximity to the quencher. This is the most important point. Don't miss this point. Right? It would address why there is no ground level fluorescence happens before amplification starts. Right? Probe hybridizes to the target. Correct? You make a single standard DNA. The probe goes and bound to a single standard DNA. Along with two molecules. One is the fluorescent dye, another one is, it's not dye, I'm sorry, fluorescent molecule, and another one is sequential. Okay? Now, the TAC polymerase, in addition to the polymerase, it also does exactly opposite action in a different direction. Remember this point. That is called 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity. Right? This is so important in QPCR here. Okay? Remember, we are exploiting the additional character of this TAC enzyme. The additional character is 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity. Uh, you should understand what is the role of this exonucleus activity. What it does, it strip off the nucleotides. Correct? It is exactly opposite to the polymerase enzyme activity. What polymerase enzyme does? It adds the same enzyme does another function that is 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity. Right? So, we are exploiting this particular activity in this probe based detection. What it does actually here? What it does is, primer is bound, probe is bound, the enzyme comes and extends the primer. In its path, it is going to encounter the fluorescently labeled probe. It is going to strip off that particular probe. So now, the probe will be disintegrated into nucleotides, fluorescent molecule, and quencher. So what happens in the process? the reporter or the fluorescent molecule is away from the quencher, right? So it is not under the control of quencher any longer. So that activates this molecule to fluoresce, right? In the first step, few fluorescent molecules are released, right? Second step, double the quantity of previous step. And third, it goes 2 power 1, 2 power 2, 2 power 3, and goes 2 power n. So every passing cycle, free fluorescent molecules are released in PCR mixture. Correct? You got it? So what happens? A reporter is separated from the quencher. With the, the consequence of this particular separation is, it is going to emit signal because it is no longer quenched by the quencher because it is removed with the help of 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity of the very same TAC enzyme. Try to understand this, this is so important. And again, the signal, signal is nothing but freely available, the fluorescent molecule is captured by the very same camera what you kept on the top of the machine. So, pictorial it is something like this. We have a fluorophore and quencher. 5 prime is a fluorophore and 3 prime is a quencher. And the double standard DNA, the DNA iteration starts at 94 to 98 degrees Celsius. And in a mixture, everything is there. You have a DNTPs, you have a primers, you have a probe, right? Everything is there. And when the DNA iteration is uh, activated, the, the strand becomes two single stands and the probe is going to bind something somewhere here 
two single stranded DNA and they, uh, they encountered this particular probe. Now what happens? The primer, this is a primer, which is again specific for the target. The primer annealing takes place here. And extension starts. The green one is the attack enzyme, which extends the primer beyond its uh, bound place. And in its path, it is going to encounter the tag, uh, um, the so-called uh, uh, probe, which is having R and Q. The primer binding on the complementary stand, DNA polymerase. Now what happens? The elongation starts. When it elongates, it removes the 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity of the polymerase removes the fluorophore, probe nucleotides, and also quencher. Now the fluorophore emit fluorescence after detachment from the quencher. Right? Now, what happens? As the cycle passes, you are going to have more and more the fluorophores in the PCR mixture. Right? So that is directly proportional to the amplicons, right? 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity of the polymerase remove the probe, nucleated, and quencher. And every amplification adds free fluorophores in the PCR mix, thus increasing overall fluorescence. Any doubts on this? It is quite different from the cyber green one. In cyber green one, the dyes bound in the minor groove and the bound dye is estimated but here the released dye is estimated that's the big difference okay so read it once again you'll understand and the two key point here is the fluoros fluorophore doesn't fluoresce when it is in the close proximity of the quencher number one point number two point we are going to remove the fluorophore and the nucleotide where it is attached and also quencher with the help of 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity of the very same enzyme which is going to add this uh, or which is going to facilitate the polymerase reaction right so this is in in a the most simplified way of explaining this the so called tachman probe based detection right so let us take the questions uh, in the end Advantage, they are very specific because you are going to have two nucleotide probes to target your uh, region. And of course, it has got uh, some disadvantage that is uh, slightly uh, technically demanding. It's hard to sequence, expensive, and of course, yeah, some reports are there, probability of false results also is there. It all depends upon the specificity of your probes, right? Now we will move on to another confusing uh, terminology or acronym that is reverse transcriptase PCR. Remember, whether it is reverse transcriptase PCR or real-time PCR, these two are very much integrated in most of the applications. Whenever RNA becomes your template and you have to necessarily go for reverse transcriptase PCR, right? So remember, reverse transcriptase PCR can be done in a conventional PCR also, right? And it can be performed in qPCR also, right? So I just would like to make a, a kind of a, a distinction here. You are going to do this practical. Uh, suppose if somebody is going to estimate uh, transcripts, number of transcripts under certain conditions, right? For example, uh, somebody is growing fungi, uh, maybe in the presence of some antifungal compounds, right? You want to know how this fungi behaves in the presence of antifungal compounds. So what is the best way out? You generate two population. One is in the absence of uh, the so-called antifungal compounds. Another one is in the presence of antifungal compounds. During the developmental transition from one stage to another stage, you harvest RNAs, okay? Eliminate all other RNA, keep only the messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA becomes your template here, right? So the question here is, uh, we cannot amplify this messenger RNA, we need to convert into a DNA. So that is uh, done with the help of uh, a small intervention, what is called as reverse transcriptase. So what you do here, you convert the RNA into 
DNA and this DNA is called cDNA. It is complementary DNA. Right? So now there are two options again. You convert this RNA into cDNA and use this cDNA as a template in a normal uh, what do you call uh, uh, qPCR that is one step. Off late uh, what is called as everything is integrated in single mixture. Right? So you have a PCR mixture we added a detector there it becomes a qPCR. Right? Instead of uh, what do you call uh, uh, RNA you are uh, instead of normal DNA you are going to add cDNA and you are going to estimate the transcription uh, what do you call uh, transcripts. Now this RNA need to be converted into cDNA. So you need another enzyme what is called as trans reverse transcriptase. You add reverse transcriptase also in the tube. So in the, uh, all in one, right? So uh, there are two different kind of uh, uh, things are there. One is one step QRT-PCR or QPCR. Another one is here I make a QRT-PCR. This RT stands for reverse transcriptase, right? And two step uh, quantitative reverse transcriptase PCR, right? So it's very simple. Uh, in, uh, uh, in single step, you mix everything together and you expect the RNA getting converted into cDNA. cDNA is getting uh, amplified along with the probe based or dye based. You are going to monitor them using cameras and the spectrophotometer. In another step is a two step. What you do, you segregate these two activities separately. You prepare cDNA separately and having prepared cDNA and take a little bit of cDNA take on board for a subsequent Q, uh, QRT-PCR. So this is two step, simple, a single step QRT-PCR or two step QRT-PCR, it's only in the word, otherwise technically activities, everything is same, right? Now, we'll just move on to uh, requirements. To do that, what is really needed, right? Of course, you need an instrument, an instrument called the QPCR or real-time PCR machine. A real time PCR machine for running the reaction or facilitating your reactions. And template, right? Very few copies of target nucleic acid, which can be genomic DNA or it can be a plasmid DNA or it can be cDNA, right? Or anything which, which you feel that is target for you. And primers, of course, you are going to design this primer. And uh, I believe there are classes in this particular course, how to design primer and all. You learn that. And qPCR primer designing is quite different from normal PCR uh, primer designing. I think the team will teach you in the practicals. And of course, if you are opting for a very sensitive and highly accurate, then you go for Tachman probes, or you can go for even uh, the routine and the most popular that is cyber green. And you have need to have DNTPs, right? And of course, the cofactors we normally use in PCR, that is magnesium chloride. We have enzyme, that is uh, DNA polymerase enzyme. And of course, a different kind of primers, which is prescribed to facilitate this kind of reactions, right? Except the template and the primers, and most of the stuff is commercially available. You don't have to bother about it. You just call a company, they will supply to you and pay the money, whatever they are asking. That is the requirement for this QPCR. And these are all the cycling conditions. Of course, this is, there is no difference. It is nothing but the conventional PCR stuff. There is absolutely no difference. You have a denaturation temperature, and you have a kind of uh, annealing, and you have a kind of extension, and all those things, it goes routine and routine. And the number of cycles, it varies anywhere between 30 to 40, right? So by the by, why this uh, is a to, 30 to 40 all the time, why it is not 70 or 80? Anybody? What is a magical, why it is 35 to 40 all the time? Have you ever thought about it? Why it is, why not it is 10 or 15? And why not it is 100, by the way? You sit and calculate, you put the factor, 2 power n, if it is 2 power 100, just see the quantum of DNA, what is going to be accumulated. I think that should be equal to several planets weight. It's not possible, right? Two reasons. One is resources are getting depleted by every passing cycle. There would be a resource crunch. DNTPs may not be available to sustain the reaction forever, number one. 
cyber green is getting depleted every passing cycle if the the quantum is getting half correct and the enzyme loses its activity after performing its uh, you know polymerization right so all resources are getting depleted with every passing cycle people found that 30 to 40 cycles are uh, a time point at which you know uh, no longer the pcr reaction can be sustained and that's the reason why it is 30 to 40 cycles right and you can do it for 100 cycle also but the quantum of product what you are getting is almost same as what you are going to get out of 40 cycles right now let us come to the data what you are going to see after doing all these things right in normal pcr what you are going to see after this you are going to see a bright amplicon of expected size you get excited right three scenarios amplicon is not at all there yeah, you become desperate isn't it amplicon is there but it is not the expected size disappointed again right isn't it and amplicon is there which is of expected size you get you feel happy right this is the kind of experience all of us faced on our other times right but in real time pcr the the results are displayed in the form of uh, what is called as a graph or graphical representation of the amplification right and the whole graph conveys a lot of meaning to us it really tells what has really happened in the machine uh, in the tube right it is broadly divided into uh, four uh, distinct uh, phases the first one is a linear ground phase right 2 power 1 2 power 2 2 power 3 i already told the quantum of dye either accumulated or released is not good enough for the machine to capture it right it's something like a distant star making a very feeble signal which the machine is not able to capture it right correct so that is the linear ground phase early exponential phase right that is some, something like you know the first gear you now moved into second and third gear now you are in second gear right you started accelerating now something is happening so that is early exponential phase and third one linear exponential phase right? what is popularly called as log phase right it's really exponential right 10 to uh, 2 power 18 2 power 19 just imagine it's double it's really exponential phase right and of course resources are limited everything got depleted energy spent now it becomes pledge right these four phases let's see each and every phase what's happening this is a typical curve what's really happening in real time pcr machines right so in the first phase pcr is just starting fluorescent signal has not risen above the background right i already told there is always a background fluorescence the only thing is we are not able to see it or the machine is not able to see it right it is unable to capture any signals right it's a linear ground phase right it is some somewhere here this one right now early exponential phase somewhere here this is early exponential phase right? the culmination of early exponential phase right so early exponential phase is a phase at which the machine started seeing the signal this is the most popular in real time pcr you know what is the name for this this is called ct values or ck values right in real time pcr machines the data what we generate from the machine is ck values only right and remember this is captured at early exponential phase right now the second phase is where the fluorescent signal is just rise significantly above the background 
the cycle at which occurs is called cycle threshold right it is also called as ct values or cq values quantitative quantitative threshold right linear exponential phase right everything is doubled quantum right so it's here this, this is what is called linear exponential phase most of the time it is either 90 degree or slightly less than 90 degrees right in linear exponential phase pcr is in its optimal amplification stage with doubling of pcr product every passing cycle that to a substantial quantum of double standard dna or amplicon is getting doubled every every passing cycle right and of course it reaches a stage where the reaction cannot sustain this forever because there is a resource crunch there is no dntps there is no uh, uh, probes available there is no dye available enzyme lost its activity right then it comes a stage what is called plateau right this is a typical sigmoid of what we found in every biological system right you would find the same sigmoid curve if you grow bacteria right if it is sustained forever, then the, the quantum of biomass, we cannot handle it, right? The last phase is where the substrates are exhausted and tap enzyme is in its uh, fake end of its life. Fluorescent signal will no longer increase, right? Now, this is a four distinct phase what we encounter in real-time PCR. And for practical purpose, we consider this CQ or CT value as a standard output from real-time PCR machines. Now, the baseline of amplification plot, the initial cycle of PCR, there is a little change in the fluorescent signal, right? Why little change? There is a change. It's happening, doubling, but the change is not perceptible by, uh, it is perceptible or it is unable to capture by, uh, the machine is unable to capture the signals, right? And increase in fluorescence above the baseline indicates accumulated PCR product, right? And Threshold line, another terminology, this is a baseline amplification plot. This is threshold line, a point at which a reaction reaches a fluorescent intensity above the background. It is set in the exponential phase of the amplification for most accurate reading. CT or cyclic threshold, the cycle at which the sample reaches threshold level, you start seeing the curve raising. CQ value of 40 or more means there is no amplification and cannot be included in the calculations because now it is well standardized that after 35 to 40 cycles, there is nothing is going to happen there, right? And another terminology we encounter in practical will teach you uh, each and every one, the mole curve. Uh, mole curve is so important for fluorescent dye based uh, detection of or quantitation of uh, any target. It is so important because I already told the cyber green based or the fluorescent dye based detection is non-specific. So when you do this kind of experiment, when you write a research paper, it is mandatory for you to produce a mill curve. The mill curve will only tell whether the primers are specific or not, right? It's so important. You should get a single mill curve, what is seen here, right? What's happening here? The DNA which accumulated the fluorescent dye, it become two single standard DNA at a particular temperature. We know what is the temperature, right? Around 80 and above degrees Celsius, it becomes two single standard. So then it become two single standard. What happens? The bound dye is coming off and there is a drop in the fluorescent signal. That's what you see here, there's a, a sharp drop fluorescent signal. The single melt curve is indicating the specificity of the primer. And it also indicates that there are no non-specific amplifications. If there are non-specific amplifications, you will be seeing different melt curves happening in the same reaction, right? You keep this in your mind. Change in fluorescence when the double standard DNA with incorporated dye molecule melt into two single standard DNA with the consequence of losing its fluorescence, right? 
So that is captured by the machine instantaneously and it gives you a code, right? And most of the modern day qPCR machines, they come out with this kind of options, right? And when the double stranded DNA bound with the cyber green one is heated, a sudden decrease in the fluorescence is detected at TM, that is what is called melting temperature of that particular double stranded DNA, right? Yeah, I, I'll just keep it off now. Now, having said that, let us take a little bit of the intended objective of the qPCR, right? So there are so many applications in qPCRs. I'll take one application here, that is changes in the expression of a gene in fungi. One application. Right? Another application is you want to estimate how much of fungi is living in a particular ecological niche. Let us take, you take a leaf, right? You don't see any symptoms, right? But you believe there is some fungi is living there if you want to estimate and you decide what fungi you want to, definitely must be working with some fungi. Let us take the example of fusarium. You want to know how much of fusarium is there in a particular sample. If you have a specific primus, which is specifically amplifying the target fungi, with that information, you can quantitate how much of fusarium cells are there in that particular niche. This is one of the direct application in plant pathology. Right? If somebody is working on seed related pathogens, you want to estimate how much of seed bone fungi is there in the seed. The requirement here is you need to have the specific primer which is going to amplify the target organism. That, that is your hand only. You have, to, you have to choose that primer and you have to standardize that. Once it is standardized, you can easily develop a qPCR method for absolute quantitation of the target organism in any ecological niche. So I brought two distinct applications here. One is changes in the expression of uh, the genes. I, one example I told you, if you want to see uh, what is really happening in the transcription of a fungi in the presence of an antifungal compound, right? What you do, you create two situations. Situation one, it is what is called as mock or control. It's growing normally. In another situation, you put that the so-called growth inhibitor. And different stages of its developmental transition from one stage to another stage, you extract RNA. That is going to be the practical today. You extract total RNA and you pool the messenger RNA and, and you want to know uh, you have the primers already specific for that particular gene, the gene which is associated in that particular uh, antibiotic resistance or whatever you call. This is one example. Another example, uh, from the host point of view, suppose if you want to know what's happening in rice plant when it is encountering a pathogen, right? So what you do, you have a rice plant, a rice plant infected with maybe a different doses of this pathogen. At different time points, you collect that RNA and do this experiment using a primer which is specific for that particular gene. So what you are going to conclude here, is there any changes in the transcription pattern of that particular gene uh, of the host in the presence of the pathogen? So these are all some of the direct applications what you can have using uh, real-time PCR, right? I'll take few slides, uh, uh, some terminologies which you might encounter. The quantification of gene expression by RT-PCR there are two basic types of our uh, RTQPCR. One is absolute quantitation, another one is relative quantitation, right? Uh, the choice is based on the experimental setup and the kind of experiment what you are doing. The level of expressed gene may be measured by absolute or relative quantitation uh, or, or relative QPCR. The absolute quantitation uh, relates the PCR signal to the input copy number using a calibration curve, while the relative quantification measures the relative changes in the mRNA expression level. What is more important here is this two application has got completely different kind of analysis, right? In the case of absolute quantitation, you need to have a kind of standard curve, right? For example, if you want to uh, estimate a particular gene, uh, the quantum of the transcripts. So what you need to know is uh, beforehand, you need to clone that particular gene and make a differential concentration and set up the PCR and collect the CQ values. 
that means for an x quantity of your target what is the c key value the machine is going to generate right and i already told if you are doing it perfectly you'll get a linear curve with a regression coefficient in excess of 0.99 it's quite easy to do that you got it so that means x quantity what is the c key value right 2x quantity what is the c key value 3x quantity, what is the CQ value? Can you tell me, as I put more and more template, what would happen to CQ values or CT values? Anybody? Decrease. If you put too much quantity of template, the threshold is going to reach very early on. I hope you understand. If you, somebody is not understanding that, you please interact among yourselves. This is very important. right? Ultimately, the fluorescent signal is directly proportional to the quantum of double standard DNA, which is already there in the PCR mix. Correct? So now, you make a curve. Standard this is so important for absolute quantitation PCRs. Right? In relative quantitation, is slightly different from that. Here, you are going to take a gene whose expression is constant, whether or not antibiotics there, or temperature is there, or humidity is there. You got it? throughout the life of that particular organism, the expression of this gene is constant. Whatever happens, I will express the same level. You have to pick that gene. That is quite tricky also. So remember, you have to standardize this every time, whenever you do this kind of work uh, using this qPCR. The reference gene standardization has to be done. Right? So the two applications will take uh, yeah, in absolute quantitation, what's happening? So you need to make a standard curve, which I already told. Yeah, linear curve, right? So you put the known quantity of the genes as a template and generate CQ values and plot them in the curve and ensure that it is really linear, okay? Don't take two time points, two data points. Right? If you take two data points, what will happen? You get linear curve. Right? Are you understanding this? You have to take multiple data points. Right? X quantity, 2x quantity, 3x quantity, 4x, 5x, 6x, maybe normally we do 10 different concentration of any target. Right? And generate the CQ values. If you take more and more data points, the accuracy of your absolute quantitation becomes very precise, okay? And this is absolute quantitation, right? So lower C, CQ value, that means a larger quantity of uh, the target and a higher CQ value, the, the target is very less. And that's a simple calculation, right? Yeah, some few points about this absolute quantitation requires the construction of an absolute standard curve for each and every target gene. That's very, very important. The standard curve is based on the serial dilution of the sample with the known copy numbers, right? And the CT of the each standard sample is plotted against the log value of the known concentration. And the standard curve is then used to estimate the concentration of these unknown samples. I already explained here, right? In relative quantitation, you are going to have a reference gene whose expression is not altered in the conditions at which you want to estimate the gene expression level. It may be an antibiotic tolerance or resistance or heat tolerance or any, any, any variables, what, whatever you want to study, right? And change in gene expression in a given sample relative to another sample, right? So I'll, I'll try to explain in a much better way in the coming next slide. Calculation methods for relative quantitation. The calculation methods used for relative quantitation are standard curve method and comparative CT, CT method and normalization to an endogenous control. And of course, we use the housekeeping genes as one of the reference genes here. Absolute quantitation determines the expression level in absolute numbers of copies. And relative quantitation only uh, gives you the fold change in the expression of between two different samples. Right? Now, for absolute quantitation, we have several online assistants. Right? You can note down this. This is one of the finest. Uh, 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 very popular also. Uh, uh, the formula is given here, how to convert the, the so-called QPCR data into uh, copies, right? 
So you can do manually if you want. This is a formula, right? So where the one which is colored red or the one what you are giving, uh, going to generate from your experiment, X is stands for the amount of amplicon in terms of nanograms and N is the length of the double stranded DNA amplicon, length in terms of base pairs, right? And manually you can do and also it is automated nowadays, right? There is a link, this is a link, sciencepriMer.com, copy number calculator for relative uh, real time PCR. So you have to give this values here and just click it, the number of copies appears somewhere in the middle. Okay, so uh, this is a copy number calculator for real time PCRs. Uh, it's very popular, right? So you will come to this stage with the two input data, one is the amount of DNA that you can always calculate with the help of CQ values or CT values. And you know what is the size of the gene in terms of base pairs, correct? Only these two things are needed. So these two things are generated by you using your real time PCR machines. Correct? And some consideration for absolute quantitation, simple setup, very easy maths, requires standard to be run every time. Yeah, this is one of the uh, very important conditions. When you do this absolute quantitation, remember, you need to do this absolute quantitation every time you have to run the standards. So that would uh, put a lot of strain on your, you know, consumables. And all experiments are conducted uh, in three replications, what is called as uh, technical replications. And you need to have at least two, at least two biological replications. If it is three, it is most preferred. You got my point? So technical replication, that means everything is done in a 96 well format and three wells for one sample. So you just calculate how many samples you can accommodate. If 10 standards are there, 30 wells goes for only standard curve, right? So remaining, you can use it for your experiments, right? Starting concentration must be measured, that is also there. Relative quantitation, I already told you. Relative quantitation with respect to target, you have a reference. With respect to experiment, you have a control. You try to understand this, right? With respect to the target gene, you have a reference gene. Remember, reference gene's expression is not altered depends upon the conditions, correct? And you also have a control which is never exposed to the conditions, right? I'll explain in a, in a, in a table format, right? Calibrator and test and target and reference, okay? You, you need to put this checkered table whenever you do this reference quantitation. Calibrator is your control. If it is a plant which is going to be infected by a pathogen, uninoculated plant, right? Test is the one you are going to study the expression pattern in that particular plant when the plant is encountering a pathogen. I come to this fungus, when the fungus is grown in the absence of a, a, a inhibitor, right? Or you are studying the effect of temperature on a fungi. What happens when the fungi is exposed to uh, high, high temperature or low temperature, whatever it is? And definitely, we'll be keeping a control at which the, the fungus grows normally. Right? That is what is called as calibrator. The test is the one where you are going to change the conditions. And you have a target and reference. A target is you know these genes are responsive to altered temperature or altered antibiotics or altered conditions. And you did a literature sur sur a survey and you jotted down some of the genes. They are vulnerable genes for these conditions and they are the targets, your real target. And you also have a reference gene whose expression is not at all altered whether the fungus is growing at zero degree or it is growing in 50 degree or it is growing with the help of uh, cyclohexamide or it is uh, growing normally, whatever conditions. So this is so important for us. So this is a mock plant or a fungi which is grown in a normal condition. You have inoculated plant with respect to plants. And this is a main target uh, with respect to uh, a plant. I can say that the effector genes are 
uh, uh, in the sense the target for effector genes or the effector gene itself. You can study that, right? For example, if you want to know whether certain fungal genes, uh, they are uh, treated as effector genes or expressed in the presence of some growth factors uh, from the plant. So the, the plant growth factor become a condition here, right? So you can study the expression of uh, the plant genes or the expression of the pathogen gene. And this is a housekeeping gene which is normally used in this kind of experiments. So what I'm trying to tell here is these four are minimal in the case of uh, uh, relative quantitation of uh, any target using qPCR. You need to accommodate all of them in your experiments, right? Is it clear to all of you? This is a bit tricky. You need to uh, design your experiment and you need to accommodate all these things there, right? There must be a calibrator in your experiment and there must be, a, of course, the test condition and reference gene and also the target. And I'm just only highlighting the three popular methods, what is presently used in, the, in relative quantitation of gene expression, right? The first one is the LEVAC method or double delta CT method. It's a very, very popular. And you've got delta C method using reference gene and also FLAF1 method, uh, PAF1 method that is also there in the literature. For all practical purpose, the double delta CT method is one of the most preferred method nowadays, right? And uh, my team will explain to you when this particular practical is conducted. Is it clear to all of you? I'm just, I'm not going to explain this particular, uh, uh, what do you call, method that takes uh, different, uh, you know, it, it, a quantum of time. Let us not do that. And some consideration for re, uh, relative quantitation. No need to know the starting concentration. Very useful for plant pathology research where plant or pathogen gene expression due to presence or absence of each other can be studied. Right? And of course, there are a number of applications. Uh, two broad applications I already told. One is expression of uh, uh, genes under conditions. Or, uh, and I just jot down a few points only. There are so many other applications. So also, first one is gene expression analysis, detection of mutant genes, gene copy number measurement, pathogen microbe detection or quantitation, or viral load estimations in pathogen, SNP analysis, and so many other applications you just explore. There are thousands and thousands of literatures are available in online. Please read in all of them. You'll understand. And uh, just brought uh, for the youngsters, you may not have seen this kind of machines. Uh, uh, there are so many machines are there in the market, much like the cell phones, you know, starting from Apple one to Android ones. So much like here also, you have light cycler Roche diagnostics, in the one what we have in our lab. Uh, uh, RBI, 7700 ILD tool, the first uh, machine, and you can diff different variants are there nowadays. iCycler, uh, IQ by Biorad, Stratagen MX 3000P, uh, 3, and off late, the 96 CFX from Biorad is very famous now, right? And uh, Smart Cycler, Cepheid, Protagen, uh, Corbett Research, tech, then the list goes and goes. So please explore, different companies are manufacturing these kind of machines, right? Thank you once again, and uh, 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 if you have any uh, questions and clarifications, uh, let us have it now, maybe next 10, 15 minutes maximum. Yes, please. Sir, you told about the RT-PCR. Then you told that we can move the other RNA, we can retain only mRNA. Is it, is it necessary to remove the other RNA? If yes, and what is the methodology we can use to remove the, means the RNA or tRNA? No, uh, see, Whenever you are entering into this cDNA synthesis, it is already integrated into the protocol. You don't have to really bother about it, right? And on top of that, the primers, whatever you are going to use, they are so specific for mRNA only. You, yeah, you don't have to remove it. Technically, you are right. You don't have to remove it. So only thing is sometimes people uh, enrich the messenger RNA. For, from that perspective only, I told you, you need to remove. It's a, basically, it's an enrichment of mRNA. Tell me. Sir, about absolute uh, quantification. Then that, uh, what is the uh, method to prepare the sample? Whether we have to take a um, just cDNA or uh, first we have to go for a means uh, PCR. We have to take a, just a factor DNA and use for that. Or whether we have to go first for a PCR and get amplification and after that quantify that. See, uh, I got your question. Uh, if you make a kind of uh, different doses of your uh, sample necessarily have to amplify it. 
correct? Yes, so there are multiple options are there. Either you isolate the, uh, the DNA and use multiple quantity of that, that is one option. Second option is you can do PCR, amplify the target and that target can be uh, you know, diluted because target is so much. So it can be diluted so that a theoretically minimal concentration comes. And the best one is you clone the gene and from the clone you go for dilutions. So three options are there. I, I leave it to you which one you want to do. All three should work technically but in our own experience the cloned one does a better job than the other two. No, okay, size of amplicon, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a size of amplicon only, yes. Yeah. We can sequence. I think you have mistaken it. I never said we have to sequence a PCR product. What I told is uh, you need to know the sequence information of that particular target beforehand. That is, anyway, it is needed for your absolute quantitation, right? Sequencing is not a big job nowadays. Yes, we can go. PCR product sequencing is one of the most sought after tool now. Every lab is doing that. Yeah. You can do that. There is no problems. And if you are uh, uh, too tech savvy, you can clone it and you can sequence. That is also there. Yeah. And uh, cloning is not a big deal. I think uh, that is also integrated in this course today, uh, this training. You go for PGMT cloning or any uh, cloning which is doable in your lab. Yeah. Yeah, there, that itself is a separate class actually. You uh, stay tuned for that. So uh, we need to discuss that in a different perspective. Okay, QPCR designing. Uh, there are conditions like, uh, you know, normal PCR primer designing. Uh, it, it need to be done in that way only, yeah. And online tools are available. So IDT is the one which is most popular. Uh, integrated DNA technology of US. They have their own online tutorial to design uh, real-time PCR primers, I think anybody can learn in no time. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. You can still go for provided you are having full confidence on the primers. And it is not going to give you any non-specific targets. Then it is fine. Absolutely no problems. That's what the, Q, the cyber green based QPCR is so popular. You spend so much of time on uh, having a very, very specific primer which is not going to give you any off targets. And uh, still you can do it because uh, the, the Melker what I showed here is our own, our own experience. Yeah. Okay, if uh, uh, no more questions, I think, uh, uh, I think some questions were coming from this side. I hope they are answered in subsequent slides, right? So if you have any more questions, you can send a mail to me and let us have a detailed clarif uh, in the sense, uh, uh, clarifications on that. But the training is not yet over. You are going to be here for uh, uh, another you know, uh, six, seven days. Let us have the clarifications in the practical also, right? Yeah, thank you very much and uh, uh, thanks the course director for giving me this opportunity uh, to address this young audience and it's the first time uh, uh, I'm uh, addressing audience coming from uh, state agriculture universities otherwise my dealing is most of the time with the IRA students. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and uh, uh, try to uh, enlarge your knowledge uh, by reading more and more because I skipped many many points here. And those things you have to enlarge, in particular the data analysis. So no uh, software can be taught to anybody. So softwares can be understood by practice only. It is what is called as learning by doing. 
So learning by listening it will not work in bioinformatics, right? So I used to always tell how uh, we all learned uh, handling MS Word, MS PowerPoint. I never attended any tuition or I never attended any classes how to handle MS Word and MS PowerPoint. We learned by doing, repeatedly doing. And this is true with the bioinformatic tools, right? So we can only tell you the tools are available and practicing is in your hand, right? The practice, uh, practice makes one, uh, one really perfect in their analysis, right? With that, I again thank uh, uh, Dr. Deepa Kamil for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you.